We get just a few short months of summer weekends in Canada, so we really need to embrace every single one of them. That goes for days when the sky is gray or the wind off the lake is chilly, or when there's a fog of mosquitoes descending on you and your family. That's why, before my family and I head outside, we need a reliable insect repellent. That's where the new Off Family Care Deet Free comes in. It works for up to five hours against mosquitoes, isn't greasy or oily like some of the other repellents, and it is safe for the whole family six months and up. Try it, and you'll have one more great reason to embrace every summer weekend. Hi, I'm Michelle Kelly, Editor-in-Chief of Cottage Life magazine. In this inaugural episode, we make some noise about being quiet, decode loon calls, and reflect on the pleasures of not doing a thing. This is the Cottage Life Podcast, where every day is the weekend. Let's face it, most of us live in places where noise is just a part of life, be it dishwashers in our kitchens or planes in the sky. But have you ever wondered how all that noise is impacting our bodies and our health? Leslie Garrett is a freelance writer and Lake Huron cottager. She took a closer look at that question for us in a recent issue of Cottage Life magazine. She's here now to make some noise about being quiet. Hi, Leslie. Hey, Michelle. Leslie, I know that you live in a house with three kids, three dogs, and three cats. So perhaps you know a thing or two about noise. I know more than I want to know about noise. <laughs> I bet, I bet. Um, I think also because you, you're a cottager for so long on Lake Huron, you're, you're pretty well acquainted with what quiet means in cottage country. Through your article, though, uh, we're sort of alarmed to find out that that kind of quiet is actually harder and harder to come by. Can you share a little bit about how you explored that? Well, at my cottage, my bedroom was at the back of our cottage, and we have a creek that runs behind And one of my favorite things to do as a kid was to lie in the top bunk. So I had the window right beside me and I would listen to the sounds of, you know, fish spawning and frogs and, you know, birds. And it was all the nature sounds. And it was maybe, I don't know, a decade ago that I I started to notice the absence of those sounds. And that was in large part what the story... um, that I've written for for Cottage Life was about was sort of this erosion of of the quiet that we used to take for granted in cottage country. Right. So it's not just that things are louder and you still hear those sounds. It's that those sounds themselves no longer exist, as well as a whole new layer of other sounds that have come in to replace them. Right. We kind of forget that um, that you know, noise has an impact on us, and increasingly we're we're getting the science of of the ways in which noise is is negatively affecting our health. But we can sometimes forget that things like um, you know boat noise and chainsaws and all that stuff has made it almost impossible for certain species to to survive. You know, birds and and frogs, for instance, use sound to find each other in order to mate. Well, if they can't hear each other, then it's obviously going to have an impact on their populations. You know, you talk about how this is something that's happening at your cottage, which is in a fairly, uh, relatively speaking to some of the Canadian wilderness, it's in a fairly uh, populated area. But this is a problem that's also happening in less populated areas. You talk about a guy in Kananaskis, for example. Yes, he's a, a documentary filmmaker, and he had just wanted to carve out 10 minutes of of quiet. And by quiet, I don't mean sort of an absence of sound. I mean an absence of human sound. So he kind of wanted 10 minutes of of wilderness quiet. And he went to a, quite a remote area of Alberta, and he couldn't get it. He could not get 10 minutes without, without largely it's air traffic. That was the the problem for him. And, and again, that's something that's almost just become, you know, sound wallpaper for, for all of us. You know, part of the reason why this problem is creeping up on us a bit is because we've become so no- noise uh, has become so normal to us. But I wonder like how have our bodies adapted to that? Well, we are increasingly aware of the ways in which noise is affecting the stress hormones 
in our body. And that, of course, leads to sort of, you know, the inflammation all in our body, including our, our heart. There's a quite a direct link between the amount of noise someone lives with on a day-to-day basis and and the health of their their hearts, which is quite con, you know, quite concerning. But conversely, we know that the solution is is relatively simple in that it's seeking out more quiet. And studies show that the higher the stress level measured by brain scans and heart rate monitors, the greater the benefits of listening to quiet. And again, I don't mean an absence of, of sound. I mean sort of that absence of, of human sound. There's sort of, I, I sort of differentiate between noise and sound. Noise is the stuff we don't want. Sound is, you know, bird song. <laughs> right, right. So at the cottage, then quiet isn't necessarily hearing nothing. It's just hearing less human sounds. Right. It's the reasons we go, you know, how often when we talk about going to our cottage, do we talk about, oh, it's going to be so nice to just, you know, kind of let my hair down and relax. And well, that's a key part of, of just that atmosphere at a cottage is that is the, the quiet, the waking up and, you know, there isn't a garbage truck outside, all that sort of thing that drowns out the sounds of nature. You mentioned like the reason we go to the cottage is to get quiet. And another reason why a lot of people go to the cottage is to connect with their friends, with their family. And sometimes that means noise. That means kids jumping off the raft and screaming as they go into the water. It means people gathering around the barbecue, listening to their favorite song and getting a bit carried away. And so how how do those sounds go into the mix? We're animals too. <laughs> right. And those are perhaps the sounds of our mating calls. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, so it's not it's not that there's this push to to erase human sound from from the soundscape. It's it's more a matter of of just being aware of how loud sort of that that background noise is. Um, nobody is saying don't, you know, don't have some friends over on the dock and, and let the kids splash in the water or, or go for a tube ride or anything like that. It's really just a matter of, of doing what we can to carve out time and space when we're at the cottage to allow kind of that, the natural soundscape to emerge. As cottagers, we're very much integrated into the wilderness in a way that we're not in our daily lives. I know you've looked at some studies about particular species and how uh, noise is impacting their uh, their health and their mating, et cetera. Could you tell us a bit about that? There was a, a woman who, um, she's a professor of conservation biology at University of Manitoba, and I love that she cottages on Bird Lake because her, her research is into the impact of noise on songbirds. And what she's found is that uh, sort of the unpredictable noise, it's sort of interesting that sort of a steady hum of just human presence isn't the problem so much as, um, you know, a, a personal watercraft that suddenly races past or leaf blowers or things like that. It's this unpredictable noise that distracts the birds enough that they stop their typical bird behaviors. They stop hunting for food. They stop caring for their young. They stop um, their, the vigilance sort of for predators tends to go down, all of which is going to impact their survival. So just things that, that, that we often just don't think about when we introduce noise into, a, into an environment. For cottagers, and what we're always trying to do with the magazine and with our content is try to give people tools to help with these problems. What are some of the things that I can do to minimize my impact? I know that you spoke with uh, the folks at Safe Quiet Lakes Initiative, for example. If you could just tell us about some of the work they're doing. Well, they did a a fairly extensive study with cottagers on the, the Muskoka area lakes what people think is noise and what they think is acceptable and so on. But generally, people go to their cottages to have, have some measure of, of peace and quiet. They've had some conversations around um, 
trying to possibly implement, uh, you know, quiet times. Um, they don't want to put themselves in a, in a position of having to please people, but just sort of try to get some buy-in that, that people will try to, you know, not roar up and down the lake in their boats at 7 a.m., for instance, or, or 9 p.m., or whatever, whatever sort of time they decide on. Um, a lot of it, too, is really just trying to get people to be more cognizant of how noise has crept into our, our cottage environments, to sort of be aware of, of the ways that we can just reduce our noise even just slightly. And that was one thing that, again, that researcher on Bird Lake um, talked about in the early morning and at dusk when birds are most active. You know, some of us, as we're trying to sleep in, are, are very aware of how active sure. those birds are. Sure. Um, but that's where, that's a time when we, we kind of just need to, you know, step to the side and, and let the birds have their, have their time she recommends we pour ourselves a coffee and go sit on the end of the dock and just take it all in. Which is great. An excuse to go and sit at the end of the dock without anyone bugging you. That's wonderful. Yes. Who wants to argue with someone saying, don't do anything, don't do any chores. (laughs) Now's not the time to cut up that tree that fell in the windstorm. That's right. That's right. Isn't that fantastic? Um, you know, I, I have to mention as we as we record this remotely from each other, we're in the midst of, a, you know, the crisis of our times really with our global pandemic for COVID-19. And it's kind of ironic in a sense that we're talking about air travel and all the ways that humans make noise. I, I notice at, at least my little corner of the world is so much quieter these last weeks as we've all been in isolation. And it's um, it's nice to know that it's causing us um, good health as it, as it continues to protect us, that we're also creating uh, an environment where we can thrive in ways that we kind of didn't anticipate. Yes, it's one of those perhaps silver lining because I know, I mean, people's anxiety is is heightened. I mean, it's not it's not an easy time, but I'm hoping it'll give people a taste of of perhaps what we don't typically have. So just this idea of I in my case there's there's much less traffic. Um we know that air traffic has been dramatically reduced, travel has been dramatically reduced. And as our world, um, you know, when it begins to sort of return to, to our, our normal, um, will those sounds, of course, will ramp up again, but I'm hoping it'll, people will, will have had sort of a taste and recognize what we, what we really stand to lose if we don't protect this, if we don't protect silence, quiet. Yeah, absolutely. Les, thanks so much for joining us and take care of yourself. My pleasure. Thanks, Michelle. I think my very favorite cottage sound is the call of the loon over the lake late at night or in the early morning. It just hearing it now, it takes me right back to the lake. Leanne Bobechko is here to demystify that sound and other sounds we hear when we're at the cottage. She's a longtime Cottage Life editor and our resident nature enthusiast, a well-known secret. Sometimes we call her Mother Nature at the office. Hi, Leanne. Hi, Michelle. So just for the record, I don't go around introducing myself as that. I do love learning about nature, though. And today, we're going to get a little bit loony. Yes, I'm so excited to know more about this. Most of us are familiar with the call of the loon, but I was surprised when I first found out that there are actually four main distinct loon calls. Yeah, when I talk about this with cottagers, they're always surprised by that, too. And they're always very interested to know what each one means. So this is great info. Yeah, it's cool to think that we can decode what they're saying to one another. Now, the one that we heard in the intro, which is perhaps the most iconic loon call, is known as the whale. Here it is again. (coughs) 
It sounds a little bit like a wolf howl. Leanne, what are they saying here? Well, if you put it through the old loon translator, it means, here I am, where are you? It's a social call, a way of communicating with their mate. Experts at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology compare it to playing the game Marco Polo. Oh, that's a fun way to think about it. Okay, so that's the whale. Now let's break down the other three calls. So besides the whale, you have the hoot, the yodel, and the tremolo. Let's talk about the hoot next. Here it is. As you can hear, it's just one note, and it really does sound like hoot or hot. Hot, I see, but that's definitely not what they're saying, I'm assuming. (laughs) No, it's sort of a check-in with family members, kind of like a, are you okay? It's good for keeping the chicks in line. So sort of short and sharp. I can see how that would make a pretty useful parenting tool, to be honest. (laughs) Okay, so that's the whale and the hoot, which are both friendly communication, right? I'm curious to hear what the tremolo sounds like. It's the one that sounds like a crazy laugh. Here it is. Okay, so tell us what this one means. Our experts told us that the tremolo means, I don't feel good about this. You'll hear it when loons are alarmed or excited, often in some sort of territorial interaction. You'll also sometimes hear it at night or when they're in flight, maybe when they're flying over another loon's lake to announce their presence. Yes, this one I, I is very familiar to me. I've heard it many times. It sort of sounds like they're laughing, actually. It does. So it's not surprising that Audubon calls it the laughing call. I guess we can kind of think of it as a nervous laugh. Ah, yes, a nervous laugh. Okay, so then there's <laughs> one more, right? What is that one called? Yeah. So the last one we're going to tell you about is the yodel. It's a call that only the males make. As you just heard, the yodel is a long rising call with repetitive notes, which can last up to about six seconds. Yeah. So this one actually has, it can be kind of frightening because it can feel really sudden. I think I've been startled on more than one occasion by that call. I know it's arresting, isn't it? And given what our experts tell us it means, that's appropriate. They said that the loons use the yodel to say, whoa, buddy, back off. This is my turf. So why is it just the males that yodel? They're sort of like the cowboys, huh? (laughs) I guess, yeah. A male loon sets up territory that will be home for him and his mate, and protecting that turf is pretty important. Right. Okay. And that turf can be a small lake or just one part of a larger lake. Is that correct? That's right. Each small lake will have only one mating pair of loons, and large lakes might have a couple. But sometimes another male may show up and try to take over his territory and his female. Aha, so that's when they'll bust out the yodel. Yes, and actually, they will often even fight, not just with yodeling, but physically to the death. Males will dive under the surface of the water and pop back up, beak first, under their rival, trying to spear him through the chest and heart. This is really quite something. We actually just had a story on cottagelife.com about this, and it was very, very popular. I think people are surprised to know that loons can get that serious. Yeah, no kidding. They seem so serene. But in fact, about 30% of these cases between loons, well, the fights will end in casualties. Ooh, certainly not a peaceful loon in that case, as you say. They clearly do not mess around. And what's also cool to know is that each male loon has his own distinct yodel, That's amazing because they all, to me at least, sound quite the same. Yeah, to us, they do. But get this, if they're invading a new lake, they'll actually change their yodel to be more like the one that's used on the new lake. And then if they go back to their old lake, they'll return to their old yodel. That is super cool. Loons are much smarter than I thought they were, to be honest with you. Thank you so much, Leanne. You've taught us so much today about the loon call. Before you go, though, I'm going to put you on the spot. I'm going to ask you for your best loon call, which is something that seems to happen often around cottage campfires, in my experience. It is for sure. It's funny. I know some cottagers worry that making the calls at the lake will disrupt the loons. So we asked our experts, and they confirmed that especially the tremolo and the yodel can cause them stress. No surprise, since these are the ones that they use to convey that there might be something to actually worry about. So I'll avoid those two, but we'll try the whale call. No laughing, okay? I promise not to laugh, but do you want to hear it first? Yes, please. Okay, here I go. Ooh. (laughs) Oh, boy. That sounded a bit like a ghost. I don't know. (laughs) And you say you're not Mother Nature. 
<laughs> I think I might have to go back to loon school on that one. <laughs> Thanks again, Leanne. That was awesome. I look forward to decoding more nature sounds with you on future episodes of the Cottage Life podcast. Thanks, Michelle. Some cottage memories I want to keep close forever. The proud look on my dad's face the first time I started the outboard without his help. Or the day my kids were finally brave enough to jump off the end of the dock by themselves. But if I could forget one thing about the cottage, it would be the swarms of mosquitoes. And that's tough to do when you head back to the city covered in bumpy, itchy reminders of every second you spent in shorts. So, to make sure my family and I remember the good stuff, we never forget to apply a good bug repellent, like off, family care, smooth and dry. It repels mosquitoes for up to five hours, and it goes on as smooth powder instead of an oily, greasy film. So now I can remember the good stuff and forget the mosquitoes. Over the 32-year history of Cottage Life magazine, we've been so lucky to have some of Canada's most distinguished writers reflect on life at the cottage. This essay by J.B. McKinnon was written for a special issue in 2017, marking Canada's 150th birthday. In that issue, we dove deep into the many things that make Canada's cottage culture special. On the Pleasures of Not Doing a Thing is read by Pedro Mendez. The first idea we gave up on was painting. After buying our cabin in northern BC, a shack, really, valued at zero dollars by tax assessors and more rustic than your average ice fishing hut, my partner Elisa and I had gotten all peppy about painting it yellow. Oh, butter yellow would be lovely, with sage green trim. Then we thought, why bother? Everyone agreed the thing was a teardown if it didn't fall down first. I'm not exaggerating here. Whenever we went to the cabin, we brought a tent in case we found it lying on the ground. It was not so much a cottage as a giant game of Jenga. We turned our attention to what I grandly called the grounds. The shack sat at the edge of a clearing, which had evolved into an enormous woven mat of tall grass and thorns and prehistoric-looking cow parsnips that filled the air with a scent like medicated foot powder. A team of us waded in with scythes, machetes, and axes. We had hardly liberated the cabin from its straitjacket of green, when an angry bird rose up to let us know that we were about to destroy her hidden nest. But of course, the briar patch that threatened our home was itself a home to many a critter. The bird was serving notice that she had prior rights. We chose not to dispute her claim. And so it has gone all through the years. We have not, as planned and planned again, repaired the roof. Careful sketches exist of our new foundation, but the new foundation does not exist. We did not put in a well or make improvements to the perilous outhouse. We have not installed a charming gate or a deck or solar panels or a sauna or a smoker or a fire pit or one of those great outdoor showers that I really love when I use them at other people's places. Even at the height of the pergola craze, we did not build a pergola. The inside of the cabin, meanwhile, looks as much like a rural crime scene as it did on the day we bought it. Over time, as with all things that are done year after year at a cabin, our inertia became a tradition. We are proud of the changelessness of the place, so much so that we feel competitive with other dormant cottage keepers. Don't mistake what I'm describing for laziness. The result of our inaction is not some hillbilly life of barefooted ease, but the hard work of living in the rough. Sometimes, back home in the city, we talk about the kind of dream chalets you see in the pages of magazines like this one then we go back to our shack in the woods and it whispers, not here. Change, we have realized, is high on the list of things we are trying to escape when we go to the cabin. The grind of so-called progress, the latest iPhone, the mania for constant renovation of our homes, our physiques, our personalities. Change has become a modern pollutant, like pulled pork, like emojis. Change can be good, it can be useful, but as often as not, it appears where it is not needed. Even the damned climate won't stop changing. Every year now, we walk down the trail, chop a path to our cabin door through the season's growth of jungle, and go about doing what we always do, sinking down into the belly of timelessness. One day, we know, the shack will fall down. Maybe then we'll build something new. Or maybe we'll put up the tent.
That's it for this episode. Thanks so much for listening. Please subscribe to the Cottage Life podcast for free wherever you get your podcasts. We'll have new episodes every Thursday throughout the summer, just in time for your drive up to the cottage. The award-winning Cottage Life magazine has great tips and inspiration for cottage living. We have a special subscription deal for podcast listeners, including a bonus issue and a free gift. Go to cottagelife.com slash pod for details. We'd love to hear from you. Post a review or email us at edit at cottagelife.com. To find out more about our magazine, our television shows, and our live events, visit cottagelife.com. This podcast is produced by Catherine Jun and me, Michelle Kelly. I'll see you on the dock.